Welcome back. Well, yes, indeed, uh, to make sense from crunching those numbers, Mr. Kola Ayaya joins us next. He's an economist and CEO of Asset Management. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Chamberlain. Oh, yes, indeed. We've seen uh, the figures from uh, the NBC saying Nigeria's inflation rate dropped to 17.9% thereabout, and I three. So uh, is that a good thing for you or what? Well, you know, the inflation rates dropped, and that's, um, that's a fact. But you're still at a very high absolute rate. Um, clearly, a 17.9 or 18% inflation rate is, is extremely high. And it's not, it's not, it doesn't give much cause for celebration. What we need to do is worry about how to bring it much, much further down. You need inflation that is in the single digit so that you can keep interest rates in the single digit and you can achieve growth. Hmm. So we are far away from where we need to be. But how does it work? I mean, how does inflation rate drop, uh, but we still see rising food prices? Uh, is it supposed to have some sort of impact or effect on those as well? Well, the, 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 the drop is marginal. You know, if you had inflation that was, I think, north of 15 or 16 percent, you know, and the rate of increase drops, it, you are still in very, very high, high regions. And then when you look at the makeup of the rates, the highest component of inflation is from food. Food inflation is very high. Food inflation is, in fact, over 20%. I mean, a friend of mine in a forum that I belong to says that he usually used to eat bread and sardine, but he had not eaten it since January. And then he saw somebody eating sardine, and he went out to buy. He said he used to buy it at 180 naira. It's now 450 naira. Mm. That's reality. Um, I hear a sachet of pure water that used to be 5 naira is now 20 naira. That's reality. So those are not things that would change with a 0.5% or 1% reduction. Those things need major reductions. And the issues are how to drive it down. You know, they, they uh, spoken severally about uh, infrastructure development, how all of those are supposed to be connected. I mean, there are so many factors to ensuring that uh, these numbers, perhaps they get it to single digits, which they've been trying for a long time now. So uh, to what extent would you say that, uh, well, those investments in infrastructure is having an impact or is this still supposed to be a futuristic thing before that kind of impact happens or what needs to be done to get that desired impact? Okay, you know, we are, we're right now entering the seventh year of this government. The government has only two more years. And I think stripped of politics, it's just necessary to have a realistic assessment. And I hope, consider a change of course. I say this because the World Bank report says clearly that Nigeria is lagging Africa. So it says that Nigeria is at a projected inflation, according to the World Bank, will be 16.5% while the whole of Africa is less than 6%. Now, against that kind of inflation rate, I think it projects that Nigeria will grow this year by 1.9% and just 2.1% or something in 2022, as against over 3% and 4% in Africa. If we're spending this much money and ending up with this kind of level of inflation, and we're still um, having a lot of people um, uh, ending up in poverty, increasing the number of those living below the poverty line, uh, and not ach achieving this kind of anemic growth. There's need for a change of course. It appears the course to date. Government has had a, this government has had a philosophy that infrastructure is key, and it is, and that government must do whatever it needs to do, including significant borrowing to fund infrastructure. I think after six years, if this is where we are at, where External debt is now about 33 billion compared to 10 billion when the government took over. I think the next two years should be one for a change of course. Yes, infrastructure is important, but you don't finance infrastructure at all costs. And what we are doing is not producing economic growth and is not achieving such massive transformation in our infrastructure. So I think there is need for a consideration of a change of course. Yeah. Um, the, I, I've always had a challenge in my head about the fact that most of our projections um, usually uh, are usually kind of terminal. 
to one tenure or one term of one government. And I, I think that is a challenge. You're a businessman and you know that if you have to um, plan business, you have to make projections, um, it's usually what you call the short term, medium term, long term. I don't think four years is long term, so to speak, considering the infrastructure deficits and gaps that we have had over the years. So let's look beyond one government. Let's look beyond what Nigeria should be doing progressively. Um, you've talked about the limits of the markup, so to speak, that, that we have had so far and how, how far away that is from the inflation figures indeed. So what did we get right, in your opinion, that gave us that markup? And what do we need to do to expedite action on that so that um, it can at least draw closer to reducing the, the inflation level? Um, let me start from the last part of your question, because that's easier to, to answer. Inflation is bad for growth, and inflation is bad for stability. Once you are having very huge levels of deficit, very, very huge levels of deficit, particularly those that are not um, transparently financed from the financial markets, inflation is inevitable. The reason why we had 8 trillion of domestic debt in 2015 and 16 trillion now, and I think that 16 trillion excludes about 10 to 12 trillion that the central bank is here to securitize. So you may actually be talking of an increase from 8 trillion to over 26 trillion. You can't have that level of government deficit and not have inflation and devaluation. It is just not possible. Now, what needs to be done? Like I said, I said we've had six years where the government's philosophy has been infrastructure is key and we're going to find money to fund it. It hasn't quite worked. I think right now what government should start, what we should be thinking about is that let's find a way where most of the funding of infrastructure can be done by the private sector, even if it is going to be delayed. And then the second thing, I think that government should be thinking of, let's work hard over the next two years to limit the extent to which we leave people worse off than we met them. Sometimes it's, it's tricky to understand how, you know, government policies keep coming. I mean, you hear different announcements, different statements, and when you look at the figures, they don't seem to match. I mean, for inflation, you've mentioned it, the major uh, boost or the major reason we have high inflation rates is because of food inflation, which accounts uh, for about 70% of the recent increase we just saw over the past one year. But remember that you had the government saying, well, we shut our borders such that we can look inwards, ensure more food production, boost agriculture. Recall, I mean, you recall the, the borrower scheme as well, giving some, some sort of funding to farmers. That's on the one hand. Infrastructure is also a big deal because the World Bank mentioned electricity. I mean, Nigerian, Nigeria actually houses a population, the highest population without access to electricity in the world, as it were. And you've heard the government speak about infra infrastructure. You've talked about it as well. So we have these government policies. But when you look at the figures, they don't match up. So where is that disconnect, really? Because you've said the government should change course. So if it will change course, where does it need to look into? Okay, first of all, you know, as I often say, it's not only important to look at what policies are being executed. It's important to choose who will execute it. In the Nigerian economy, as indeed any economy, there are three economic pillars. There's a private sector, there is government, and there are um, 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 households. Nigerian households are poor and weak. Government is inefficient. The private sector is still our best foot forward for executing major economic projects. And what could have been done differently is that rather than government undertaking huge borrowing to fund infrastructure, perhaps it's better to look at how to position the economy so that it will attract investment from the private sector to do the same things. The private sector will obviously do those things more efficiently and much, 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 much cheaper. That's the one thing. So now, talking about going forward, I actually think 
that if we are at $35 billion of debt, or $33 billion of debt, instead of 10, where we took off, one legacy the Buhari government should try and leave is a foreign debt that is not higher than what it meant. And I think over the next two years, if it is possible to work hard, to find funds, to take us back to 10, even if infrastructure, further infrastructure development tanks a bit, mm. I think it's much better. Mm. You, you know, I, I, I want to quickly get some, maybe, it would be hard to get closure on that debate about uh, whether government should handle things or the private sector, because the argument uh, against that will always be, if the private sector comes in, then, of course, the private sector wants to make profit. What does that mean for the poor who can't already afford things that maybe government is even involved in? So what happens when the private sector comes in, private sector wants to make profit, and clearly the prices might be high, or, or what? people have to pay. So can we ever get closure to that argument? Because perhaps that's the thinking of the government saying, let's be involved so we can at least mitigate uh, you know, the effect on the people. Yes, we can. In 1999, because government wanted to do telephone lines, it kept doing the telephone lines, and the poor had no telephone lines. There were less than 750,000 telephone lines across the country. Today, we have over 100 million telephone lines employing a lot of those poor people who didn't have jobs. You know, the communication sector has lifted a lot of people into the, middle, into the middle class, the people who they have employed and the businesses that have worked for them. I don't think we should say that, particularly in Africa, I don't think we should say the jury um, is out. The jury is spoken. The private sector is not perfect. But the, and I'm a pro-poor person, and I'm not anti-government. I love this country. It's the only country I know. Up till today, I have had the opportunity at least once, a major point in my life, to take a foreign passport, and I've declined it. And I still do not have a second passport. I, I do not, I'm not against government. I am pro-people. I love, I love to, for poor people to be lifted up. But I, I look back and I say what we've done so far has not worked. Let me also quickly, if you permit me, say this. There are a number of things that can be done with inflation and growth and transformation. What is uh, painful is that, you know, the most obvious and the easiest things to do usually um, disproportionately affect the poor. Now, the discipline of government is not to start there. You know, for example, um, just shortly after this government took over, the then secretary of the US government, John Kerry, said that they have reviewed and they found that more than $9 billion of defense spending were traced to um, accounts of different Nigerian individuals. You know, this government has been big on anti-corruption. Before we do something that will affect the poor, can we say that $25 billion, we want to find a committee of globally respected citizens, including one or two from Nigeria, to shop for that $25 billion, you know, as a goal, and send a strong signal that we're going to find the $25 billion we've lost from abroad so that we, are, we don't leave more debt than we found. The second is that we need to reduce the quantum of waste in government budget. And institutionally, we also need to find institutions with professionals, professionals including um, cost managers, quantity surveyors, um, uh, accountants, in a new kind of framework that starts to budget from zero base. You know, zero base budgeting is I assume that there is nothing I budgeted last year that I need this year. I'm going to start from day zero. And so we, we clean up our budget from the kind of zero, zero base. Those are things that will first of all affect the rich and affect the bureaucracy. It is that that then gives government the basis to say, let's now do the things that will affect the poor. So for example, we then close the exchange rates. You know, in an, in an import-dependent economy, devaluation is inflationary. It's very, it's, it's, it spikes inflation. It affects everybody, much, much more so the poor. But you don't have a... The only thing that is worse than it is maintaining multiple exchange rates, which then encourages, can encourage speculative activity and can make people just make money through arbitrage. So when you have done that, that, does, that affects the rich, and it is seen that it has affected the rich, then let us affect the poor. I mean, so let's close exchange rates, and then let us negotiate with labor that this country can no longer afford any form of wealth subsidy. But don't start, we can start with the things that affect the rich. The, Give me, uh, I just wanted to break it down because I think you just proffered solution to the debt problem. Talked about the, uh, the, the, the exchange rate and subsidy. But for that debt problem, if I got you correctly, it sounded like a very straightforward solution. How easy or hard will that be getting 
I mean, people to shop for that funds, if I got you correctly. Okay, let me say this. There is nothing that can happen in transforming an African country, including Nigeria, that is easy. We're in a bad, we're not in a good place. We're in a bad place. So it's not going to be easy. It's going to be determined. Let me tell you what I mean. It's a pity people like um, um, uh, someone like um, Emeka, uh, I mean, someone like uh, Kofi Annan is dead. If Nigeria sends a signal that says that our debt is 35 billion, over the next two years, we want to reduce it to 10. We need to find $25 billion of Nigeria's money abroad. And this is the committee. That committee will be backed by um, uh, um, a framework of professionals. But the face of this effort is um, um, Emekayok, who is President Obasanjo, and it is um, um, one of the foreign prime ministers of UK. You're sending a strong signal that you are not joking. Will it happen easily? No, it won't. Will it be possible? Yes, it will. Am I saying it's not? Why do I think it is possible? I said, on record, the secretary, the former secretary of state of US says, we have it on record that we found $9 billion. $9 billion is not, is not, is not, is not um, little change. So it will not be easy. You know, if we are looking for easy solutions, we, should, we might as well go to bed. We are not in a good place. We need hard, difficult um, 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 propositions. But I think it's possible. I think it can be done. That's why I want to repeat again. I'm not against government. I'm not, I, 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 love, I love this country. And I also love poor people. Not in, I mean, one of the times I, one of the institutions where I served, I used to travel a lot between states. What used to break my mind was just to look, even between traveling between state capitals. And then you look at the road, and these are major roads. And you look at the quality of houses where people are living. We need to lift poor people up. Whether it is with the best of intentions or not, is besides the point, what we have done for six years has tripled foreign debt, has more than tripled domestic debt, and it's only produced 1.9% economic growth, and it is producing more than 100 million people living below poverty line. It's not politics. It's just let us look at it and say, okay, we meant well, but this hasn't worked. This last two years, maybe we should change course. And maybe if we change course, maybe even if we don't leave the average Nigerian much better off, we won't leave him worse off than we met him. Interesting place. Uh, so, Anchor, we do thank you very much indeed for your perspectives. Mr. Kola, I, uh, an economist and CEO of Asset Management. We'll be back Chim in a moment. Chamberlain, Ayo, and Thank you very much for having me. All right, then. We'll be back.